Welcome to Why It Matters, Talks on the American Past. I'm Brian Hosmer, and on behalf of the OSU Department of History and the Edmund Lowe Library, it's my pleasure to host the first in a series of five events featuring OSU History Department faculty authors. We come to you from the library's beautiful Angie DeBow Room, a most appropriate venue for historians who are deeply engaged in conversations across audiences. In a moment, I'm going to introduce tonight's featured scholar, but first let me say a few words about this series. As you know, books represent the gold standard for scholarship in the field of history. Each book represents years of work combing through dusty archives, followed by the painstaking task of organizing a thesis and presenting research in clear and accessible prose. We celebrate our colleagues' accomplishments. Though our department has a long history of distinguished scholarship, it appears that this is a banner year. To our knowledge, the release of five books in a single year is unprecedented. And so we want to recognize that as well. We also organize these events to communicate the importance of history, why history matters to historians. Studying history isn't limited to pursuing a personal passion, although that is part of it. Historians' craft, then, is a second goal for these events. In that connection, it's important to understand and talk about what motivates historians to undertake this kind of work and how they engage their subjects and their audiences. And speaking of readers, broadcasting these events over Facebook Live extends our message beyond our classrooms and professional networks, and I think that's exciting. A third goal follows the notion of audience. Historians often speak to the conditions of our communities and beyond. It's said that while historical research focuses on certain points in the past, the present inevitably shapes our understandings and even why certain topics capture our interest. We believe history not only presents the past but informs our world today. And as you'll see, each of these books we feature engages issues of contemporary interest. And in that sense, what we do today and through this series extends the land-grant mission of this institution to educate and inform society more broadly. We hope that in addition to being informative and entertaining, this series reminds us of the importance of higher education generally, of history, and of this place in particular. The series that begins today continues in December on the 3rd. Then we pick things up in February with subsequent gatherings in March and in April. Please keep an eye out for announcements. All events take place on the first Thursday of each month at 4 p.m. Before moving to the program, I want to share some gratitude. My deepest appreciation for my colleague, Dr. Sarah Griswold, Assistant Professor of History, who organized this book series. Dr. Griswold is a specialist in European history whose classes this semester include one covering the social history of the First World War, a timely topic indeed. Dr. Griswold also drew upon her background in museum work to conceptualize the series and assemble its many and moving parts. I want to thank Katana Davis from our department who is managing social media and publicity, Kendra Carlson and Bobby K. Lewis from the College of Arts and Sciences and the college itself for generally supporting this program, Bonnie Kane Wood and Nina Thornton with OSU Libraries and our friends at the OSU Foundation. Now to the main event. Tonight's featured author is Dr. Dr. Holly Carabo, Assistant Professor in the Department of History. Dr. Carabo earned her PhD from the University of Toronto where she developed expertise in North American borderlands, the American social and cultural history, women, gender and sexuality, and the history of drugs and alcohol. Dr. Carabo focuses particularly on the history of vice, labor, and sexuality in urban spaces. Her first book, Sin City North, Sex, Drugs, and Citizenship in the Detroit-Windsor Borderland is a fascinating excursion into illegal economies on both sides of the Great Lakes during the period following the Second World War. She's currently researching relationships between federal drug treatment facilities and incarceration, again in the middle part of the 20th century. Entitled, A New Home on the Range, this project has received support from the Oklahoma Humanities Council, the Betty Ford Center, and other agencies. That's in the future. But today we're directing our attention to her latest book, Border Policing, A History of Enforcement and Evasion in North America. 
published by the University of Texas Press and co-edited with Dr. Dor George Diaz of the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. This collection of essays draws our attention to state regulation and border policing in two regions on both sides of the lower 48. These essays are diverse, readable, and pivot around a number of common themes, as we'll see. For those of you watching, please enter any questions you have in the chat function, and by some magic that I do not understand, they will get to me, and I will relay them to Dr. Caribou. So first of all, congratulations on the publication of this volume as well as on your first book, uh, and welcome. So with that, let's get started. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so um, the first thing I want to talk a little about is the, are the reasons for undertaking this book project. And I referred to this in my, my opening remarks. What led to this collection of scholarly essays coming together under one cover? And what did you and your co-editor, George Diaz, want to accomplish? Yeah, well, thank you for, for helping to organize this as well. Um, the, the volume really started in 2015. Uh, George and I published our first books the same year. And George's first book looked at the history of smuggling along the Rio Grande Valley, and mine looked at the Detroit-Windsor region. So we had a book launch together jointly and um, began a series of conversations where we noticed a lot of overlap in the topics. Though we're looking at very different border spaces, there were a lot of conversations that really sort of mapped well together. Mm -hmm. So we decided that this might be a really important way to build a collaborative project with other scholars. Um, importantly, that are working in the U.S.-Canada and the U.S.-Mexico borderland contexts. So it was also 2015 is you know, leading up into a pretty tumultuous political discussion around borders, immigration, policing. These were constantly in the news. And we thought, you know, historians should be part of this conversation, that this is, while a unique moment, that there's got to be a much longer history that would help us you know, sort through some really controversial and difficult topics. So, you know, we had an eye in the moment when we were creating it, but we wanted to bring history, you know, into the public discussion Fan around these issues. Fantastic. I like that that notion of your scholarship, but then you're, you're paying attention to what's around you mm -hmm. and wanting to speak to that. I think that's really a critical part of, of this research and a lot of other, I think, cutting edge research. So historians write different kinds of books, mm -hmm. and many are single author works or what are called monographs. Others are built around contributions by many scholars. Uh, the second generally requires an editor or editors, uh, and the first you do it by yourself. And since you've done both, tell us mm -hmm. a little bit about the craft of history. Kind of talk about that and how does an edited volume, producing an edited volume, differ from producing a solo uh, monograph? Yeah, it was definitely a, a different experience and really different process. Um, historians by training often spend a lot of time alone in mm -hmm. the archives working with old documents and through old boxes. And then you move to the writing process and you spend a lot of that time alone. And um, this was a very different experience because by nature it's a collaborative effort. So uh, the editors, you know, in a lot of ways, but George and I thought of ourselves as, you know, we created the research questions and we really, you know, it was our job to kind of cultivate a conversation among all of the, the contributors that we reached out to and that ultimately ended up in the book. So, you know, it's, it, it, it certainly, it takes some of the, uh, the control you have over your project away a little bit, or mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a different type of um, writing experience. But it was also, I thought, really, uh, really great experience. First, we lucked out with some fantastic uh, scholars and authors in the volume, but it also, you know, teaches you to look at writing differently and you get a chance to read other people's style and see their process and, and contribute right. there. So I actually really appreciated the collaborative aspect to it, which is a little different than how we're kind of traditionally trained in that's a, the discipline. That's a great way to put it, right? That that we're often solitary characters. Mm -hmm. And so this is this is working out of form a little bit for us, right? This is developing new skills that are collaborative and thinking about the craft of history and writing and also mm -hmm. engaging with other people's work yep. uh, and trying to trying to stitch it together with other things, right? Mm -hmm. So you're so you're really doing assembling a bunch of different things. So it is a different it's a different skill altogether. If you're just joining us, we are um, at uh, Why It Matters, uh, Talks on the American Past, um, co-hosted by the Edmund Lowe Library and the uh, OSU History Department. Uh, our guest is Dr. Holly Carabo, and we're talking about her latest book, Border Policing, A History of Enforcement and Evasion in North America. I'm Brian Hosmer, the head of the History Department. So let's get down. We've talked a little bit about the craft, mm -hmm. and let's sort of start digging down into some of the substance of this book. Sure. And we hear a lot about borders and boundaries. <laughs> you just talked about 2015 and that you were engaging a, 
an increasingly heated conversation that had a lot to do with borders and a mm -hmm. lot to do with border enforcement. It's become, over the last several years, no less heated, uh, no less contentious. I think maybe the conversation moves in somewhat different directions, but nevertheless, it's a conversation that, that has persisted mm -hmm. uh, in all kinds of ways. Um, when scholars talk about borders, when historians think about borders, what do they mean, one question, and then maybe add to that, how do how do you distinguish borders from borderlands? Because mm -hmm. you, we talk about borders and then you're, you're a borderlands historian. Yeah, you know, that's something that historians and scholars in, in a lot of fields, in fact, uh, engage with. What does that mean? What is a border? What is a borderlands? This is a, it's a huge debate and uh, we'll go into all of the nitty gritty. But for this book, we, we thought we use those terms in uh, a few particular ways. Um, the border itself, you know, we, we usually, when we talk about it in this book in particular, we're, we're talking about the legal line and boundary of a nation okay. state that where you know it claims its territorial boundary. Um, and because we're dealing with policing, we are dealing with legal issues and those questions. Um, but borderlands differ. Um, borderlands can come to mean a sort of a series of things. We look at it as a geographical space of a region that uh, you know covers that national line and that, that sort of straddles the national boundary. Um, but we also think of it as uh, more of a, a sort of cultural construction. In other words, a place that people, ideas, goods come together and that don't fit neatly within the context of a nation state or that challenge in some ways that sort of strict boundary line idea. So within each of the chapters, our authors are, are really sort of talking about borders and borderlands and you know, those multiple, multiple levels. Um, and I think that that, that helps us you know, in some ways, it, it, it can be sort of a, a messy undertaking to make those definitions and where does a borderland begin and where does it end. Right. Um, but that's part of the, the process of what we do as we, we, as we sort of unpack these studies. Um, I think that's a really interesting and, and critical distinction that, that you're offering. And, and it's, it speaks to maybe the, some, one aspect of the, the public conversation and the public imagining of borders mm -hmm. as these fixed things. Right. Right. They're fixed. They're stable. And, and because they're fixed and stable, if there are transgressions or violations, that somehow is unnatural and a, you know, a, right. a bad thing that happens, right? And that, that, that really speaks to the border as a line, uh, not border lands, mm -hmm. as you're kind of describing it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, that's a really interesting and, and important distinction that maybe a place where historians can contribute to public conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, I think the idea that um, you know, there's one side or the other is, is clearly, it's, it's much more complex for, for communities and people who live along that national border region uh, who may cross on a daily basis and have family on both sides of the border or, you know, rely on businesses on both sides or their livelihood relies on that cross-border connection. So it's, it gets much more complicated than just sort of a strict nation state boundary mm -hmm. line when you start sort of digging into what that looks like on the ground for people. And people, right? People and communities, exactly. right? Who, who, who intersect and right. live in these environments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I return to that maybe in a little bit. I want to, sure. I do want to talk a little bit about your chapter. Mm -hmm. And and maybe and, and in a way that also intersects with your first book a little bit and and um, we're getting into the to the sex and vice and and <laughs> and uh, uh, drugs activities uh -huh. right so so um, so anyway your essay though focuses on public and official discourse right it focuses on conversations and the way that that public officials frame border enforcement and frame these notions of, of illegality and legality and, and transgression. And so I really found that super interesting and maybe you can kind of describe to us a little bit about why the conversations around the, bo around the border, mm -hmm. in addition to just the activities themselves, why the conversations mattered to you and what it was yeah. that you found intriguing about, about the framing of right. these borders. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in public rhetoric and the way that politicians, lawmakers, uh, media outlets, the way that they portray particular spaces, in this, this case, border regions. Um, they're, you know, it's really interesting and fascinating to me because when you're, you know, you read a Senate hearing based on, you know, an issue that's uh, supposed to be happening along the border, you're often hearing from lawmakers and people who live nowhere near a, a border right. region, but have this image of, of what that means. Um, in my context, this was the concern about drug smuggling in the post-World War II period, so in the 1940s and 50s. And they really, the, the rhetoric about borders affects public policy really directly. Um, the idea of these as places of danger, 
um, of places of infiltration. You know, the language around that is really what fascinated me. And particularly the way that that language differed depending on the side of the border you were looking from, all right? The perspe your perspective depends on where you sit relative to that line. Um, you know, and, and, so, and also the differences between the way the US, Canada, and US, Mexico are sort of represented similarly and differently depending on the context. So mm -hmm. that was something I kind of wanted to dig into. How did concern about drug use in the 1950s turn into stricter border enforcement? Uh, and and who, how did public rhetoric shape public opinion in that case? You also, you also spoke about how the rhetoric around border enforcement and around um, crime and mm -hmm. vice and the kinds of things that really attracted the attention of people like Senator Estes Kefauver and <laughs> right these these whole congressional hearings about vice and crime and 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 mafia right. uh, all of these things sort of how those worked in a couple of different ways you're on a borderland so there are different governments in place here mm -hmm. and there are different political cultures that are at work and you're describing a moment where they sort of do both things on the one hand there was a there was a kind of a confluence a growing together of notions about the border mm -hmm. and so you had canadians and and us officials speaking in some ways the same language mm -hmm. and then at the other hand right you also describe ways in that it that it actually worked to uh, make it more difficult to co-manage a boundary right. or co-manage a border. So these same rhetorics, right, were mm -hmm. pulling in different directions. Yeah, and it's it, in this particular case, it's the, you know the Cold War is looming over this. The idea, um, on the one hand, that building bridges with your neighbors is what you you should do. You know, unlike communist countries that mm -hmm. you know put up curtains and walls, we're going to you know tear them down. We want tourism and capitalism and travel. And on the other hand, you've got public officials, particularly in the U.S., but on, on, in all three countries, U.S., Canada, and Mexico, that blame their drug problem on their neighbors, right? That the U.S. saw Mexico as the source of their drug problem. Canada saw the United States as the source of their drug problem. And so this created all sorts of conflicts between you know, what you're hearing officially in terms of international relations. And then when they're actually speaking and, and when you're blaming your neighbors for your problem, it, it, it's a little harder to come up with diplomatic uh, agreements. So. Exactly right. You're blaming yeah. me for your problem, mm -hmm. right? It's that, and we hear, we hear discourses. I think these days echoes of that, right? Mm -hmm. Where there's a conversation about with the flow of uh, drug trafficking. Right. Is it a matter of supply or is it a matter mm -hmm. of demand? And the argument as well that those are those are illegal substances that are being supplied by some people over there. And the response is, but wait a minute. Uh, the people over here are buying them, right? right? And so there's a sort of, I think, the same, a similar kind of, kind of equation at work. Yeah, exactly. And you know, by the by the 1950s, you've got a pretty clear the groundwork of what we'd recognize as border enforcement uh, mapping onto drug enforcement in pretty clear ways. So that's, um, you know, a relatively new phenomenon, but something that's been building for decades yeah. now. So it's become so deeply in, intertwined the conversation around border enforcement and drug enforcement that we almost think of them as synonymous in some yeah. ways, right? So that's, yeah. that's something we were interested in tracing some of that, that longer history. That's a great example of historians speaking to contemporary times mm -hmm. and thinking deeply about the roots of the conversations that we're engaged in right now. And I love that about this. I also really like the, the paradox and the irony of, of the Cold War and walls. Right. Right. Yep. And then at the Cold War, right, the, it's the communists are building walls and, and we're tearing them down. And mm -hmm. yet that, that becomes mixed up and confusing when it comes to illegal activity, right? Is there a wall or shouldn't there be a wall or right? Mm -hmm. What does that mean, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you know, the 1950s is gonna see, on the one hand, an attempt to build those international relations. And on the other, uh, it's going to see massive uh, raids of undocumented peoples and deportation campaigns. So so you're, you're seeing this, uh, you know, um, sort of conflicting, uh, conflicting events happening at the same time. So I think that that's an interesting sort of parallel. It is, it's a really interesting parallel. So I've got, we've got some questions Great. Uh, from the audience and uh, one is from Dale Ingram and, and the question is, has the border rhetoric, quote unquote, mm -hmm. really changed much from 1950 to 2020? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a great question. What I would say about the border rhetoric is that it, um, it sort of ebbs and flows as a political flashpoint. And so you see similar parallels. I mean, we can take that from the 50s. You can go back to the 1890s and see arguments for building walls. You see the first immigration laws um, or expanding immigration laws, putting in quotas and caps and regulation. Um, so in some ways, you know, there are certain ideas about borders and regulations that um, they, they sort of, uh, they, they 
arrive at particular political moments and when they become politically useful um, to talk about the dangers of borders and closing borders and being stricter and, and cutting immigration caps. Um, that enters the public rhetoric uh, again. So yeah, I think there are a lot of parallels and the issues that people were concerned about, I think were uh, you know, we, quite similar, the language that they used around it. And certainly the racialization of borders has been at the heart of that um, from, from sort of early years. And we hear that in public debates today. And that's a, that's a huge part of the conversation that we're having. What does it mean to regulate a border and, and who gets to say in that? So yeah, I think there are direct parallels that, that historians can point to to help us think through some of our contemporary context, especially when it becomes particularly inflammatory and really politically divisive. Um, and so this is something that becomes, uh, it has become increasingly partisan. That wasn't necessarily the case. Parties have supported different forms of immigration and border enforcement uh, over, over the years. So mm -hmm. following you know, how that changes, I think is also really important. Indeed. Uh, just as a reminder for you just tuning in, this is Why It Matters, Talks on the American Past. I'm Brian Hosmer, and we're, I'm here with Dr. Holly Carabo, and we're discussing borders, border policing, border enforcement uh, in the context of her book, Border Policing, A History of Enforcement and Evasion in North America. Uh, if you have a question, please feel free to enter it into the chat, and we have several here, so I'm going to go to a second okay. one. And, and this one comes from Anna Zaida. There's so much attention to the U.S. today, in the U.S. today, to the U.S.-Mexico border, but much less to the U.S.-Canada region, especially relative to the concept of danger. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear Holly talk more about the different images of these two spaces historically and in the present. Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a great question. Um, so when, when, when I say the border or if someone says the border reference, oh, I can almost guarantee people's you know, minds sort of go to US-Mexico if you're in the United States, um, or at least if you're in uh, the lower portions of the United States. However, you know, it, again, the side of the border you're on matters too. Living in Ontario for 10 years, Canadians are much more aware of the national border, its mm -hmm. impact on their daily lives, its impact on travel, uh, on you know, uh, customs duties, on, and the political implications of what happens in the United States matters and affects Canada too, in a way that people are, are much more uh, acutely aware of in some ways. And so there's this sort of perception, you know, this notion of the world's longest undefended border mm -hmm. or the world's friendliest border that's often put. Post 9-11 in particular, that's very, very different on the US-Canada border. And so this myth that, and in fact, we've got a 14-day quarantine right now if you even tried to cross into Canada, of course, because of COVID-19. So there is this sort of perception that the US-Mexico border has been sort of a site of lawlessness or violence, and that Canada has been, you know, this sort of peaceful place where people can just cross easily. And neither of those are factually accurate, but they paint really, um, important contrasts that have shaped our public discussions and understandings around um, our relationships with our, our national neighbors and uh, international policy and, and how we understand uh, how we understand those relations. So yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And it's something that historically has, has sort of, uh, you know, been, been rooted in a much longer history that, that we talk about quite a bit in border Indeed. policing. You do. And, and, it, and it reminds me of some of the contributions in this book that that really revolve around questions of race and indeed poverty, right? Race and class and mm -hmm. how those how those concepts uh, distinguish the northern and southern border, mm -hmm. I think, in really profound ways. Yeah, absolutely. Those divisions um, are, are clear throughout all of the essays. Um, but I, you know, the one thing that we also wanted to, to be clear about when we're talking in the northern context, um, Issues are, even though there's this sort of perception that of the sort of uh, that racial difference isn't affecting Canadian border politics, or um, you know, we certainly focus on indigenous uh, borderlands and sovereignty as a as a major debate and issue on the northern border. Um, but also the, the you know the immigration and the different communities that have existed along the northern borderline um, paint a much more diverse picture than I think often gets portrayed in these national images. Um, you know, think of something like Canadian bacon or whatever. You think Indeed. about those sort of pop culture references to the borders. It's, it's of course, much more complex. And you've got French Canadian contingent that, Indeed. you know, complicates this uh, sort of ethnic dynamic. And um, so all of this is, you know, I, I think part of what we want to do here is think about these as um, 
much more complicated spaces and ones that are deeply uh, divided, but maybe not in the, the ways that we think of so starkly. Just complicate um, the story a little bit, mm -hmm. right? And there's more nuance and, and complexity to this, and I think that's incredibly important to, yeah, absolutely. To, to move beyond these binaries, right, that we have in our minds. So I want to move to a couple of other questions and, and that uh -huh. have come to us. One is from your, it looks like from your co-editor, from your collaborator, oh, <laughs> George Diaz, and uh, regarding Borderlands in film, are there any particularly useful examples for class conversation? Classroom yeah. conversation. Oh, that's great. I, so I teach a, a, the history of North American Borderlands as a comparative course. Um, a, a couple of, of films that I've, I, I show and have students write analyses of, one is the 1959 Touch of Evil, mm. Orson Welles, which is sort of classic yep. um, depiction of the U.S.-Mexico border of crime, of juvenile delinquency. So I get them to really think about how those are being portrayed in race and police corruption. These are major topics and themes in it. So it's really a fascinating way to think about the post-war culture um, through a really, also just really interesting film and film it's noir. It's a great film. Um, yeah. And then when later in the semester, when we were looking in the northern context, uh, I had students watch Frozen River. Oh, yeah. um, which is a great de depiction, um, you know, of uh, deals with um, indigenous borders as that are bisected by the U.S. Canada border. It deals with you know things like uh, human trafficking and um, jurisdictional authorities and what happens when someone crosses into tribal land versus uh, you know fe what would be federally controlled crime and then poverty and what what sparks people to have to migrate or to. Uh, migrate undocumented or to act as traffickers. Uh, so it, it sort of, it gets you to think about the human elements, I think in some ways um, that's, uh, that is, is really useful. Although I always try to remind my students it's not always as dark and dreary in Canada as that, that film makes you feel, but it fits it, the mood of the topic. It, it does, and I, you know, I think maybe, maybe an observation or a thought for our, our, our viewers out there, uh, those of us living in Oklahoma are living in a place of many borders, some of which are invisible, and some of which have really come to light again, particularly in the McGirt decision, where all of a sudden borders that were assumed to be um, invisible or, or um, relics of the past are now becoming visible and enforceable perhaps in a certain way. So I, I toss that out there mm -hmm. as, as something to think about and maybe we can get a response from our viewers or somebody who's think, maybe thinking a little bit about Oklahoma and tribal boundaries Absolutely. because we're a place that has many boundaries. Uh, in, in the city, in the state. So I have a couple of other questions that are coming in and, and um, this one is from the Facebook Watch. Um, are North American borders singular in ways that other borderlands, in other words, e.g. in Europe and Latin America are not? So like asking, I guess, sort of an international comparative um, question. They're singular. I'm not sure if I'm taking that term uh, exactly how you mean it, but um, I think that they, I think we might think of them as, as more singular or we might envision them. Whereas, you know, I think particularly this case in Oklahoma that, that you're mentioning reminds us that uh, borders shift and the power dynamics in, inherent in them will, will also shift. Now, we don't have the, quite the same mobility as say within European nations and, you know, the European Union opens up a whole conversation about national borders, um, sovereignty, freedom of movement that, um, you know, I think we don't quite have the same parallel conversations here. And, and in fact, it becomes increasingly more, more difficult even for you know, uh, cross-day travel, for example, for mm -hmm. tourism or shopping or whatever it might be to, to, to cross. You, know, you need a passport now, whereas you didn't before. Um, so I do think that we, in, we invest a certain sense of sort of power of those as, as the overarching um, preeminent sort of state line. Uh, but I also, you know, th there are conflicts locally and, and regionally between nations, between states and provinces over, you know, environmental laws or all sorts of things that call into question where those, uh, wh who actually has the sort of legal jurisdiction in that boundary and what that looks like. So I'm not sure if that, I'm answering your question exactly mm -hmm. on singularity, but I do think that when you get down to sort of local borderlands context, whether it's fishing rights or all sorts of things that play into debates about the border, um, it becomes uh, more complex and those lines aren't quite as singular or as static, I think. And they, they go before the courts. They, I mean, these are international uh, discussions, especially in cases you think about the Great Lakes, that borderline goes right, it's in a lake. <laughs> so, lake. you know, yeah. it's a little harder to determine um, and, and raises all sorts of questions. So I think that, that that sort of complicates some of that singularity, perhaps, that we, we might invest in the idea of borders. 
Well, re we've received a couple of questions in response to my observation about uh, indigenous borders, so, so I'll try to kind of stitch them together a little bit, and, and, and one of them speaks to a preview of the book itself and, and, and what you would see as the book's conversation dealing with indigenous borders and how those, how those contributions sort of flesh out and, and, uh, and this conversation. Uh, we've referred to it a number of times, but what does this mean? So within the context of the, the research in border policing, um, our authors look at this in a, in a number of ways. Um, the idea that the state sort of argues that it invests its, its power and authority and it determines the spatial formation. And, but that, that clearly comes into conflict when you have nations within a nation. And so it's a much more um, complicated dynamic. Um, one thing that we were interested in, in sort of unpacking was this idea of the difference between um, sort of formal policing and boundaries and informal ways of policing and enforcing uh, boundaries or, or laws. For example, one of the chapters on pe policing peyote as a practice Indeed. crosses multiple jurisdictional lines, nation states and, and nations and tribal nations. And so this, this raised all sorts of questions. And so, you know, that was this thinking about this sort of informal, what we might call like soft power, um, ways in which enforcing a moral ideal or code, um, then, you know, was also overlies also the enforcement of, or attempts at enforcing national boundaries, but also maintaining tribal sovereignty, which is always a really tricky and, and challenging um, form in relationship to, to have. Tribal sovereignty and, and, and tribal borders, right, by by nature challenge this exclusivity, exactly. right? They, they, by, their, by their very definition. And so you have nation states that as one of the principal um, activities or principal expressions of national sovereignty is deciding where the boundary is, right? right? This is sort of like, along with citizenship, these are things that sovereigns do. Who's in, who's out, where are the lines? Those are basic things. And tribal uh, entities cross-cut that, right. right? And so by their very nature, so, so maybe you can, you talked a little bit about peyote, and there was another essay in the book about tobacco and mm -hmm. how and how how these these um, really competing uh, kinds of ideas about boundaries and borders and sovereignty affect things like policing and affect things like even the imagination of borders, right. the discourses around borders. Well, and one of the the interesting aspects around um, that that we we tried to to get into in this volume was. The fact that when you talk about policing, there are all sorts of levels of jurisdiction of policing, and then when you have tribal, uh, you know, police forces on top of um, what is already a complicated uh, jurisdictional sort of uh, conversation about, you know, who is responsible? Is it the local? Is it the state? Is it the federal? The provincial? Wherever uh, or tribal uh, legal system that's going to cover a particular act, and that 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 also reminds us that these are not static and fixed. And they're, like I said, they're often fought in court about jurisdictional and legalities and, and, uh, and the like. So I think it, it is a, in some ways, you know, borders are the place where the state tries to make itself a, sort of asserted as a nation most mm -hmm. clearly, and ironically, the place where they're most vulnerable, um, or that, that recognize that that is not always a fixed fixed boundary. So I think right. that it's that dynamic that's, that's so fascinating. And me. tribes will say, you're splitting my people in half. <laughs> Exactly. Right? We have family over there. And so this leads to me to, to another question of mine. And, and one of the things that's fascinating about this book and about your, your first book is to think about the people who live in these parallel and paired communities, right? right? So we have these, and we just talked about indigenous communities where you're physically splitting Mohawk communities or Toronto Ojum communities. Right. But we have places like Detroit and Windsor in your work, work right? Uh, Laredo and Nuevo Laredo paired communities, Tijuana and San Isidro, south mm -hmm. of San Diego, again, paired, paired communities. So presumably they're not separate communities, and yet they are, mm -hmm. and there's a sort of paradox at work there. They're linked in small and large ways and then separated in other ways. How does that work? So if you're somebody living in those communities, and you can speak about your own work and maybe some of the comparisons with these other essays, but on a daily human, mm -hmm. right, lived experience. You have these people across the border and you're part of a same, in some sense, this, a shared reality or a shared mm -hmm. world and yet not. Right. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's precisely that dynamic that got me interested in borders in the first place. As I moved from Michigan into Ontario, I, I was really sort of struck by that, that relationship. So just in, in my own research on Detroit-Windsor, um, one of the things with border is often there's a uh, there's a sort of power differential between both sides of the border. Um, that, so in the case of Detroit Windsor, there's a clear size difference between Detroit and Windsor in terms of population. 
Um, and yet they're, they're deeply interconnected. People live on one side of the border and work on the other. Um, there's all sorts of ways in which people interact on a daily basis. If you stand in downtown, for those of you who've never been, if you stand in downtown Windsor and you look around you, a lot of the skyline you're seeing is Detroit because you know it's less than, or it's about a mile across the river. Um, and so there's, there is an affinity, there's a sort of cultural tie and connection. People cross for sports games and theater and you know, going out for you know, dinner or shopping, whatever it might be. Um, and so even though they're, they are technically divided, there is that real cultural uh, connection that I think is just, just a really fascinating dynamic. I mean, sometimes it can lead to panics or concerns and efforts to sort of slow uh, crossing. I just uh, am coming out with a journal article on juvenile delinquency on the U.S.-Mexico border in the 1950s, oh. and there was a real panic to shut the border from teenagers uh, going into Mexico, you know, for a night of revel revelry and debauchery, as one article put it, and then crossing back into the U.S. So they, you know, they proposed putting a border ban on teenagers or anyone under the age of 21 from crossing the border. So this is, you know, in the on the one hand, it's it's close connection, but then the, it does raise all sorts of uh, of um, challenges in the Great Depression. The issue of uh, workers crossing into Detroit, for example, becomes a major political issue as they're worried about jobs for uh, on both sides of the border, and so that leads to stricter border regulation. So, you know, in these in these challenging times, it might cause a, a problem, but on a daily basis, those are fluid communities that, yeah. that are connected. That's really interesting, also, that you that that your examples here of of these tensions involved uh, policing morality, yep. right? Always. And there's that, <laughs> and then jobs. Right. right, and jobs. and these are these are common things, mm -hmm. right? Policing morality and protecting jobs. Yep. Those are those are really really interesting. So we have another question from uh, from the audience. Uh, uh, Brooke Coe, political scientist. How does the book speak to how politics of the borders have shaped the power and authority of the state? That's what that was. A, thank you for that question. Uh, yeah, it's really at the heart of what, what we wanted to understand. What does uh, the authority we invest in policing national boundaries? What does that tell us about the authority we're willing to invest in the power of the state? Um, and you know, we started this increasingly thinking about the militarization of border policing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got surveillance drones, you know, night vision goggles, you know, heavily armed uh, guards. Uh, you know, all of this is part of the reality now. Fences, obviously, or walls. Um, and this certainly was not always the case. And I think that you know what it tells us, and this isn't just border policing, but it's, it's policing more generally. We do see this, this shift um, in terms of the, the use of technology, surveillance, for example. Um, and that tells us something about the, the power we're willing to invest in, uh, in policing apparatus. Um, and you know, one thing that we, we also really tried to, to stress in the introduction is that border policing doesn't just affect borderland residents, that this is affecting people all over the country, whether it's immigration or uh, you know, all sorts of, um, there's so all sorts of ways that people could be affected by the, the power that we give uh, to border regulation. And so you know, we can argue uh, you know, whether it's good or bad, and those are political debates, but um, what, it, what is evident is that this has increasingly happened. And so that helps us understand the shifting power of the state in, in the way that, that we've been sort of willing to, to in, invest. So yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really at the heart of one of the main questions that we had going into the project. So. You're watching Why It Matters, Talks in the American Past with Dr. Holly Carabo, uh, OSU History Department, and we're talking about border policing, enforcement, encroachment, uh, sovereignty, nationhood, all kinds of things like that. Uh, if you have a question, please feel free to deliver it through chat and it'll make its way into this conversation. I got a few more questions, some sure. from the outside, I'm gonna, but I wanna pick up on what you were just talking about, this current topic about policing. And I'm interested in, the, in policing and the militarization of border too, but also even digging down a little bit deeper and responding to some things that you mentioned a little while ago. And, and, and who polices borders? Mm -hmm. Who are the police? Who is this? Is policing, border policing, a single phenomenon? Uh, or is it multiple? Does it shift over time? It strikes me that, that some of what we're talking about here really involves a fluidity of policing, right? In mm -hmm. terms of the individuals and what they do and what they are empowered to do. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, one of, in the framing of the book, one thing we really wanted to make clear is that when we say policing, we're not just referring to you know, the sort of literal agencies that, that regulate the national line, although that's important and mm -hmm. part of it. You know, this isn't a, a history of, say, INS or any particular agency. Um, so we're interested in, in, in the, the actual uh, techni technical sort of um, practices of policing, but policing happens informally too. And so we wanted to uncover the way that 
um, social values, community pressure, uh, vigilantism, um, all sorts of unofficial ways in which policing boundaries happen within these border regions. So those could be racial boundaries, they could be class boundaries, moral boundaries, um, but that this takes place, it's not always at the hands of the official state that, that this policing apparatus actually emerges. Mm -hmm. And again, you also have not only internally many jurisdictional boundaries that, that policing ha happens through, but you have both that on both sides of a national border, which complicates a lot of you know things like cross border smuggling or you know how do you police that? Whose interest is it to police that? Um, you know, and, and where should the resources come from? There's all sorts of kind of questions around that. Um, thinking through, uh, you know, policing from these sort of multiple perspectives. So we wanted to make it clear within the the book that um, policing takes place on multiple levels and that. Um, we kind of wanted to understand the impact it had, not just in policy and what happens in Washington or Ottawa or Mexico City, but how that then impacts people on the ground that are enforcing laws um, or that are the ones that are being enforced, essentially. Right. And I think this, this distinction that you're drawing between different layers of policing, and there can be the informal policing, there can have a racial dynamic. Also, gender is, a, is, a, is a, an enormous variable when it comes mm -hmm. to policing. And, and I, particularly, it seems to me, when it intersects with local autonomy. So what I'm driving is you can have rules that are made in Ottawa and Washington or Mexico City, and then that's a long way away from the border right. where you have vulnerable people, right, operating in this. And so there's so there's another dimension, it seems to me, to policing that's that's episodic, local, uh, has different kinds of power that power differentials Absolutely. that are playing out. Yeah, one of the one of the chapters, this is an example, looks at um, the author looks at the uh, policing and prohibition and the w the role women played in smuggling uh, alcohol. And you know, when you think about things like prohibition and enforcement or drug interdiction, you know, it turns out these are lucrative, uh, you know, endeavors for people living in places without a lot of job opportunities, for example. Or, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which individuals interact differently than what lawmakers anticipate Indeed. or don't understand what they, they need or want. Um, and there, then that essentially sort of just reroutes a new economy, which is an underground one. And so it's this constant game of trying to control something. That very control ends up often making it, either dispersing it and making it sort of more widespread, making it more violent in the case of alcohol prohibition for, or drug, uh, drug prohibition. Mm -hmm. So it's this interesting sort of dynamic of the state never sort of, sort of like whack-a-mole, never kind of, you know, it just sort of, it, it pops up somewhere else basically. And so I, I think that that's also a really interesting dynamic. Yeah, this gets, that gets to this idea of the, of the fixed boundary again, right. right? It comes back to this, this fixed permanent boundary and what a human being, human beings move around, right? right? I mean, and so it operates in a contrary fashion to what humans do and have always done is yep. they move, yep. right? They migrate. So well, and, and, you know, and economies rely on it. Uh, exactly. Migrant workers are are the one of the most foundational in the agricultural system the U.S. and Canada have built. Indeed. And so you know, to to talk about closing borders, well, things like farm interests don't want that. So it, it's a lot more complicated when you start looking at. Uh, you know, and obviously the issue around human rights and food scarcity, and there's all sorts of, of challenges that aren't addressed by maybe one set of policies that, that whether it's changing an immigration quota or changing, uh, you know, refugee numbers, all sorts of other challenges emerge too. We have a question from Facebook Watch in Arizona. How has the environment played into how borders have been created and policed and evaded? Is it impossible to write border history without being an environment without it being an environmental history at the same time? So we're thinking about the physical, the environment, but also environment, and I think maybe in a broader sense than that. Yeah, no, it's a um, it's a great question, and certainly um, environmental policy or the impacts that humans have on the environment have has been sort of deeply engaged in this. I know our contemporary conversations around border walls, the environmental impact has been a, a major Enormous. element of, you know, for whether that's, uh, you know, cattle that need to migrate or whether that's wildlife or, you know, any number of, of issues that play into these, these conversations. Um, you know, I had mentioned in the Great Lakes region, the environment is obviously at the center, whether that was industry in the 19th and 20th centuries um, or, you know, like I said, things like fishing rights or these debates. So, you're, you know, inherently uh, one of the elements of policing is certainly thinking about the, the natural environment, not to build that distinction too clearly or too distinctly, but um, this is absolutely part of the, the conversations around borders and um, jurisdictional boundaries as well, because again, the environment doesn't follow nation state boundaries. That's right. not how the 
that you know things work in sort of outside of this man-made uh, process, and that has to be taken into account. Otherwise, we can't really understand many of these broader dynamics as well. But yeah, no, it's a great question. And environmental historians have, have played a major role in thinking about space. Uh, it's meaning, it's meaning for people, but it's meaning in the natural environment as well. And thinking in that context about the St. Lawrence River and the St. Lawrence Seaway, a shared boundary in right. some ways, right? Yep. Uh, but at the same time, one that through development led to major pollution issues in terms of you know, particularly mercury poisoning right. and other kinds of PCBs that then that then crisscrossed the borders, right? And all of a sudden, who's... Whose fault is this? Who's responsible right. for cleaning this up? Yep. And you get into that kind of jurisdictional and even cultural sort of conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so. I think that's super important. Um, we have a question here on sources. Mm -hmm. What kind of sources do historians use for studying the people, not po the police or the state who live on the U.S.-Mexico border? Can't you hear, can you hear directly from them in the archives? So that's a really interesting research yeah. question. What kind of voices? emerge in the archives and whose voices and how are they mediated and that's a great question for a historian and thinking about writing history. Yeah, no, thank you for that. It's a, it is a, re a really great question. So I, in my own research, I'll just speak to, to um, what I was working on. Part of the challenge is you're using state records. So um, I, if I, you're studying vice, the, the useful thing for historians is it's well documented because many of the activities were illegal and therefore fell into the legal system. But that doesn't mean it's telling you anything about people's motivations or uh, their experiences. And I'm, as a social and cultural historian, that's something that I'm particularly interested in. So it's really a process of um, sorting through state records in a way that's um, sort of looking for the voices of the people, even, even if they may not seem immediately there. Um, one example, when I was uh, do research on sex work in Windsor, for example, using police records. You know, they give you demographic information about individuals, but by compiling that, I start to get a picture of, oh, people were migrating from Montreal, and, uh, you know, they, and you get a sense of, you know, who they were married to, or where they came from, or, you know, all these bigger pictures. It doesn't necessarily tell you about them as, as people, but it gives you a, a insight into maybe what motivated them to move to Windsor, to yeah. Uh, work in an illegal industry. Um, and so that you can sort of mine the archives in that way in the state. I um, mean, Paul Gutenberg argued uh, the warning of talking like the state. If you're using state archives, you have to be very careful about not just replicating categories Indeed. like prostitute and drug trafficker, but you have to think about what those categories mean and how you can think of them in sort of multiple perspectives. So, yeah, and I've encountered that in my own work where you have, you have voice that's mediated. So you'll right. have uh, indigenous people um, and their and their quotes, their direct words are filtered through the right. state, and so you ch the challenge is who's really talking here, right? Yep. Who's whose voice is that? And that's a, 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 a an important historical challenge. Absolutely. Uh, different kind of question, Victor Baeza. What is the what is currently the most most in quotes policed border area? Has it always been the most policed, or has that changed over time? So a couple of things. What's most right now? And, um, and how has most, I suppose, changed? That's a giant question. Um, most policed. Uh, I'm not, I don't know. I, it's the easiest to, to quantify. Um, if we're talking in North American borders, um, you know, I, I mean, I, certainly portions of the U.S.-Mexico border, I think, are, are, are quite clearly um, more uh, visibly militarized. Again, portions of walls, for example, if you go to Nogales, the wall runs right through those cities and people's homes mm -hmm. are built right up to the wall. Yeah. And so it, it really, um, you know, dissected uh, or bisected that city, I should say, um, in, in pretty uh, immediate ways. So you can still cross, but it's, um, you know, if you go to Nogales today, for example, I mean, you're going to see the... Uh, you're going to see the police helicopters and, and people on, uh, you know, border guards on uh, the hillsides, and you know, you can feel the apparatus certainly. So, uh, you know, that that is very much visible. But then again, it depends on where you're crossing. If you go to Detroit, Windsor, it's also incredibly, uh, you know, regulated and uh, in, and intensely so. Um, you know, so you have to you can run into border guards on the streets of Detroit because it's within their jurisdiction. So, um, you know, I think that in sort of urban neighborhoods where there's high, uh, high, high sort of cross border traffic, um, those are going to be you're going to see the literally see the policing apparatus much more visibly. Um, but certainly there's been an effort to control spaces in between as well that that have been um, that we sort of think of as, as 
you know, un, it's sort of unregulated. But in fact, technologies have, have enabled border uh, policing apparatuses to to control even more more remote and rural areas and more directly. So it's been an increasing uh, process. Like I said, 9-11 was a major shifting point, particularly on the, the U.S.-Canada border. You saw a lot of changes instituted in, in uh, the, you know, as part of the war on terror and that response. So yeah, as a, as a native of Maine, uh, mm -hmm. It really changed our lives in a lot Absolutely. of ways where, where you just needed a driver's license right. to cross the border into Canada back and forth. And they were really, it was a un, relatively unpoliced border. And yeah. then after 9-11, passports. Right. You know, it just really, really changed changed life. And, and there was great objection to this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how dare you? Right, impede my movement right across the border. And uh, business, you know, businesses were concerned. They were, they were. Use, you know, it, it, borderland economies rely on that movement, right? They they need the cross border uh, migration of people and goods, and if that that's impeded, then that that's a real problem for local communities. So that that also you know plays into uh, you know some of the pushback. Is some of it's just sort of you know on a day your if your business relies on tourism. You're not going to want to see that uh, see no, that no. institute. And I think that's a really important point, right? And because we tend to look at borders as as um, dangerous, and that border crossing as problematic, right. and and something that needs to be controlled. But as you're saying, if you're a business on or near the border, it's the opposite, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's not that you you're sort of against any kind of control, but right. your livelihood right. depends on movement. Yep. It depends on the back and forth and that flow. Uh, of humanity and spending, right? And so, mm -hmm. and so, in, in some ways, wherever where you're sit or where you're situated, right, affects the way you look at the border. Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have a different kind of question, and um, from Dale Ingram, how do we purchase this book? How are you marketing it? Great right. Question. So that's right. <laughs> so here it here it is again. Right. This is the book. Right. So the downside to having a book come out in 2020 is uh, you've got the COVID pandemic, which means, uh, which is partly why George Diaz couldn't be here with us today, to which I wish he could be part of the mm -hmm. conversation more directly. Um, but we're all used to lots of changes, speaking of, uh, uh, speaking of global shifts. Um, so uh, the University of Texas Press, um, it, you know, sells through their website and then any other book, you know, any online you can order, but you know our goal is really we've been trying to do um, digital, uh, you know, talks. Um, George and I will be at Columbia uh, in a few weeks. Um, you know, we're trying to sort of get the book out there so that it sparks this conversation. And, and um, you know, certainly, I think uh, you know in the middle of COVID, it raises questions about state power, about um, migration and movement of peoples or the lack thereof. And I think that so while it's an unfortunate uh, moment to have the book come out, it also it's t oddly timely in a way that Indeed. opens up all sorts of conversations. It does. And so if you're interested, you can go to uh, the website of the University of Texas Press and look for this book. Uh, you also can um, come to our website, come to the uh, Oklahoma State University History Department website, and we'll be sure to direct you. Uh, in terms of the places to purchase the book. So there are all kinds of ways to do that. And please um, buy the book, right? That's a good idea. It's just a, a, a word, word of wisdom. We've got about 10 minutes left in this program. And so I want to remind everybody that this is Why It Matters, uh, Talks in the American Past with Dr. Holly Carabo. And we are talking about border policing in the context of her new book, but also her first book, Sin City North. Uh, and, um, and you can send, in the last few minutes here, send uh, a comment to the chat and we'll be happy to, in, to, uh, to involve it. Um, I've got another question here for you and that is, um, what is the future of borders and borderlands? And I'm not really talking about policy and necessarily policing, but it strikes me, and we've been talking about this, you just mentioned this in the context of pandemic and we're doing virtual talks, and mm -hmm. it seems to me that that one of the things that's happening is that we're crossing borders all the time now. Uh, if not physically, mm -hmm. then then we are crossing borders virtually. I participated in a uh, a conference um, in Moscow in in Russia about three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't there, right. uh, but nevertheless, <laughs> crossing these borders. So, can you sort of think through that for us, and maybe help us think? a little bit creatively about what this means in this, particularly in the post-COVID world where this, this change to, to virtual life has accelerated, right? Uh, you know, to, to a point, you know, well beyond what we might have expected a yeah. year ago. Yeah, it's, well, historians are never always that, you know, that great at predicting the future, but we're I, terrible I think... at predicting the future. Right? <laughs> so, you know, 
take that <laughs> take this for, for what it is. But no, I, I do actually think there's a, a couple interesting things going on. And now with the pandemic, it's, it's making me think through these in all sorts of new ways. Um, is on the one hand, you do have this, uh, you know, transnational connections to people uh, that are just every facet of life has been affected by. And, you know, I do think that that's uh, and that's been growing. We, you know, we've been talking about globalization since the 70s is sort of a term. So uh, this is clearly in a in a way that is all encompassing in, in a lot of ways. Um, but on the flip side, I, I also I think it's it's not coincidental that we're also seeing a rise in. Uh, nationalism, uh, efforts to control borders, you know, real fears about uh, refugee crises, mm -hmm. about migration. Um, and so it's it's almost like there's sort of a, a fear and response to some of this and an unease with um, these migrations as well. For example, you, you know, you'll read about how, uh, um, you know, how global warming is going to impact uh, migration of peoples and, and food stuff. And, and this is going to uh, you know, raise all sorts of questions about borders and boundaries and, and who, who deserves the right to cross. Right? There's, a, there's always sort of these moralistic elements to it as well. Um, and so, you know, I think that it, to me, it's this, this dual on the one hand, we, you know, you can make a case that we are much more connected and that in some ways state borders are a little bit, you know, maybe less affecting our lives directly, it seems potentially through, through those connections. But in fact, we've, we've seen a real panic to reassert those boundaries Indeed. around the world. And right. so that's, I think, you know, a sort of parallel that. And we think about, but we can think about borders, and, and the, one of the things that, that strikes me is, or is the nation state attempting to establish borders around the internet? Right. Right. And so there's a different kind yep. of border, right? And and we have this competition mm -hmm. that's taking place right now, and and having to do with China, but also having to do with the United States, and 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 TikTok, and mm -hmm. and all of these various platforms, and assuming that they're somehow carrying right. danger, right? So and again, we've sort of got this 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 uh, 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 kind of repeating kind of notion, right? And, sure. and that you have these virtual uh, virtual platforms that are transgressing borders and bringing bad stuff with them. Right. You know, and, I th and then the state trying to grab a hold of this. Right. In many ways. Yeah, I think it's gonna be, I, I mean, I don't know how it's gonna play out, so sorry, I can't, can't, can't uh, fill you in on that, <laughs> but it certainly- It's fascinating uh, though. It's fascinating and it's troubling and it, something uh, to, to, to pay attention to. And, and you know, uh, the claiming of territories or, uh, you know, all sorts of things are happening right now that I think are, are fascinating that raise questions about both policing and, and borders in, in new ways. So I think we have time for a couple of questions. Okay. And one comes from here and I have one last question, Great. so so I'll, I'll reserve the last one for myself. Sure. Uh, Callie asks you to talk a little bit about your new project and a new home on the range and sure. and and drug treatment and and just give us maybe you know the the skinny on that. Yep. What's this what's this book all about? Yeah, so I, I was interested in the the longer history of of um, the relationship between uh, efforts to treat drug addiction, but efforts to police and punish uh, drug users and, and their connection, as well as the rise of um, you know, what we now recognize as mass incarceration and the prison systems and their shift in the 20th century. So my new book looks at the history of the Fort Worth narcotic farm, which was a place where um, between the 1930s and the 1970s, where uh, a federally funded establishment where drug users either could go to voluntarily get treatment or they could be mandated there by the court system as part of a punishment. And so I'm using the farm as sort of a window into the shifting dynamics between do we treat people as a, do we treat addiction as a medical problem? Um, or is, is this largely a, a law enforcement question? And if it's somewhere in between, how did, how did professionals and how did individuals that were uh, affected by the system navigate that relationship? So that's, that's sort of my, my next That is goal. another timely project, yeah. right? I mean, and we're, we're <laughs> Sadly, deeply engaged yes deeply engaged in this conversation after decades of, of um, really a tough war on, war on drugs and, 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 um, and, and seeing the implications on the other side and, and, and now sort of debating and thinking about, yeah. you know, how would we, is this a public health problem? Are these, are these people criminals? Are there people with problems? Right. And you see state by state relaxing um, drug laws just and all kinds of week. ways just this mm -hmm. week just this week and so and again this is this is related both to uh, finances and mass incarceration but also 
uh, deeper conversation about what's what exactly is the problem here, right? In some ways, it's a, deep, a definitional issue, right? What's what's the issue here? And in some ways, you know, I think it's a fascinating question about bi bipartisan politics. Indeed. Uh, you know, going back all the way to at least the 1950s, parties could agree on, or you know, both parties could agree on some elements of the building the, the, the war on drugs or these programs. So, and even today, questions about mass the, incarceration. In the are, 90s, certainly the parties agreed. Right. On, you know, to to yep. um, criminalize more, yep. to make the punishments more severe, uh, widespread sure. agreement. And it's come around the bend on the other way where there's, where there's a, a, I, I think, a blurring of partisanship when it comes to these mm -hmm. things. Maybe the parties are approaching this slightly differently with somewhat different goals, sure, but nevertheless sure. coming together. So I have one last question, yep. and it's a, a different question, and I want to ask you a little bit about about your teaching, mm. and and so maybe we can tie these things back to another part of your life and another part of your profession, and how does your research inform what you do in the classroom? Yeah, great. I, so I teach kind of a range of courses. I've, I've taught the Borderlands course that I, I talked about earlier. Um, I teach U.S. cultural history, social history, gender uh, uh, history of gender in America. Um, History of the Present, which is a really fun course. You get a chance to take it if you're watching. Um, but it, all of it is sort of informed. I think one thing that, I, that Borderlands helps me think about in the classroom is to not take those categories for granted or as, as static. Um, in the Borderlands class, I love starting with a map that has absolutely no political boundaries mm -hmm. on it. Um, and, and one of the goals of the class is really to sort of undo the training we've had that when, when you see a map, you know, you know, I know where I can find Oklahoma now. Uh, you know, I can find Michigan, looks like a mitten, right? They, how do we, how do we untrain our, ourselves to, to not just assume there was just this sort of set march towards the way that maps exist in this moment? Um, and so I'm, I'm really interested in, in that process. And um, one of my favorite activities of the first day is trying to get, um, uh, to get students to identify areas along the U.S.-Canada, U.S.-Mexico borders oh, nice. to orient themselves and what they recognize there. Um, and that's always kind of a, a fun thing to do. But, you know, in some ways it's, it's, it's sort of counterintuitive. If you look at a history catalog, it's United States history, history of France, history of China, whatever it might be. It's very nation state driven. And borderlands historian is, or history is the, Polar, sort of in some ways, it's not, it's not about not studying the state, but it's about not taking that as the only useful framing for our histories. And of course, in US history, borders shifted constantly, colonial powers were always you know, fighting over territory, um, and we can't just assume the United States would become this, this space that it is now. And so I love playing with those ideas, thinking about that relationship. Um, and I, I, don't, I always find students really kind of get into that. Yeah. And, and it takes a bit. It does. It sort of it challenges your brain to, it's, to it, think it, in it, a different it way. It disrupts your way of thinking. It really right? does. And, and exactly. <laughs> and that's the that's part of the fun of it, yeah, right, is to absolutely. think differently and, and to challenge students also and, and to think about the nation state itself. And it is a, in human history, a comparatively recent phenomenon. Right. Right. It's about, what, 500, 600 years old, really, as a, as a concept, at least in the Western world, right? And, and it was assumed that there's something natural and permanent about it. Well, not really. Right. right? It's, that's it. So I think that's where we'll call it good. I, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, thank you for joining us. I want to uh, express my appreciation again to all the people who made this happen. It was a tremendous amount of work. And, and what you're seeing uh, on your Facebook feed is about 10% of all the work that took place. And so I always want to keep in mind that there's all of this stuff that's happening, including people here in the room with us who are managing all the technology and making sure that this works. Uh, I want to thank you again, Dr. Caribou, for a fascinating talk and taking your time to, to really think deeply with us about borders and borderlands and enforcement and policing and all of the many pieces that intersect there. I think it's just fascinating and important and timely in our world today. Our next event, takes place on December 3rd, same time and place. Our guest is Dr. Laura Arata, who will share perspectives on her new book, Race in the Wild West, Sarah Bickford, The Montana Vigilantes, and The Tourism of Decline. I really find that concept really interesting, The Tourism of Decline. So with that, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you everybody for tuning in, and we'll see you in a month's time.